It's day two at TurboCraft and today we break down the 930 motor and determine its bill of health. So we're starting the tear down by removing the fuel injectors and the fuel lines. Yep, take these big lines off of there, get them out of the way. Then we're gonna take off the entire CIS in large chunks. This off, manifold off, put this thing down to a long block, flip it over, repeat on the underside. And uh, then the fun stuff happens. And the fun begins. Pull it down in big pieces, see what the heads look like, see what the cams look like. Kind of know what all is going to be required on the rebuild side of things. Is it going to be quick and easy or is it going to be a little bit more involved? Yep. Yeah. So what did you call this again? The fuel distributor. The fuel distributor, right, yes. right, right. So it's good practical German name, so it literally does what the name says. Distributor fuel. This is a first generation blow off or a research valve. Really, it doesn't blow to atmosphere, it blows back to the air intake. So you shut the throttle body here, all this back pressure after the intercooler above the throttle body is pressurizing this, but the manifold vacuum acts against the piston here, pulls the piston up, allows the air back down to the intake of the turbo. <laughs> this is what, sure the BMW 2002 turbo came out first, but this is what made the cars actually stay on boost somewhat when you shifted gears. That is this crazy. This is what made it work. This is the largest blow-off valve I've ever seen. Yes. And there it Boom. goes. The uh, brains of CIS. <laughs> that is one massive piece. Yeah. Solid iron on the uh, fuel distributor. So these were the ones that flowed more, and so they were more desirable. This is the so called Euro CIS, easy to tell by the black iron. The uh, downside is long term, now that our fuels have alcohol in them, which absorbs moisture. These are less desirable because they rust. So oh. for performance modifying, you are better off actually taking the late generation aluminum ones backdating them internally to be non-lambda and modifying them for more. But really I don't care because yeah. we're never using that thing ever again. Nope. So if you're after is... little little itty bitty mods to your car. That's right. Little baby steps. This thing is coming apart fast. So we're still retaining the this manifold here. And the throttle body. And the throttle body, right. But stuff like these old fast thermo valve switches. Gone. Gone. Cold start valve. Gone. This. Uh, this is a bimetallic spring operated auxiliary air regulator. It's a, a totally analog idle valve. For the okay, for the common person, it is a, a, an it's idle an valve. valve for a, for, yes, it's an analog idle valve, and it's now, of course, going to be a modern two wire electronically controlled. Ooh, I like electronic. Just like that, oh. intake manifold is off. Where am I? Donners. Right. So look at the, that. Here's the original CIS injectors. Here's your mouse. Oh, there's our friend. Oh no. He didn't survive. Oh, oh no. See, we, we thought we were going to find a mouse in here, and we definitely found one. Oh, gross. All right, back to our program here. <laughs> oh. oh, gosh. Yep, okay, so there's our fuel injector. Sprays down kind of behind the intake valve, but it's a little off tangent. It's kind of odd the way they do that. It might have been part of their strategy for swirl. Of course, it might have been just the only way that, you know, Gunter or whoever the engineer was figured it could fit. Regardless, doesn't matter. Our fuel injectors are pointed directly at the back of the intake valve, just like all the late model cars. It helps with mixture and and like you said, these injectors open on fuel pressure. Strictly pressure. Yep. They have a popping pressure to open them, and then they just flow more as the pressure so increases. It's an analog fuel injector. Check that out. 100%. Up next for removal is my B and B exhaust system here. We're going to be replacing this with a proper flowing TurboCraft muffler. 
piping, and all that jazz. That looks like a heavy piece. Not the lightest, and... It's cracked, yep. right? Yeah. See all underneath there. Lack of gusseting, so the outlet pipe is cracking right at the canister. Uh, good riddance, right? Or I'll put it up on eBay and sell it for a million bucks. Vintage. <laughs> oh, no, it's not vintage, it's classic. Parts. Yeah, classic. So on the front side, is this considered the front side of the engine or the back side? Yes. So this is the back side of the engine. This is the scavenge oil pump, right? Correct. And it feeds oil to the... Dry sump tank. So it, it dry sucks. sump tank on the opposite side here. Yeah, which would sit right here in the car. Yeah. So, yeah, the high pressure oil feed comes underneath the manifold to the turbocharger. And because the turbo is set so low, it's not like a conventional engine where you have, say, a dash 10 line and it feeds down to a oil pan. So these have a little accumulator tank, a drip tank underneath the turbocharger. You shut off the engine, the oil drains in there and it just collects. But when you start the engine, that scavenge pump is running the moment the engine's cranking. It's mechanical, it's right on the end of the cam. And that sucks all the oil out of this tank, returns it to the dry sump tank. On the back side here. Not a bad system. Very reliable. However, this fitting here is not coming off. So this is our first encounter with, I guess, a rusted fitting. Semi permanent. <laughs> so some of you may be wondering, what is this fan and what does it do? Chris, take it away because okay. I certainly don't know. Uh, this is the primary cooling system for these engines. They are air cooled. So this fan is constantly in motion as the engine's running, belt driven right off the crank. The axis it's on is actually the alternator. So the alternator is inside there as well. Wow, that's fan really cool. On one. It sits in nice aluminum housing and then it uses this plastic shroud to distribute the air to all six cylinders. We'll see that when we lift this off in a moment. It even has this little dog house that comes and forces air over the oil cooler, which is mounted behind cylinder number six. Ah, so sense. that's a carryover from back when these were little tiny engines, just two liters. They still have a engine mounted oil cooler. It's the first one to come into play. And then at the same time, you have these ducts that come out. And what are these all about? This is the heater system, fresh air, or the air source for the heater system. So this blows through these ducts, blows down into heat exchangers, which are wrapped around your header pipes. And then that comes out the front here and goes up into the chassis. So down around. So, yep. And then pops out the other side. It goes up, up to, to the some side fresh here. air mixing valves in the chassis, left and right. So you move the cable or and what bam, you have, you have heat. That's right, here's your source of heat. So that's one of the reasons it's important to have all this stuff working. If you have big gaping openings like that and it's just leaking air, that's also your cooling air getting out. So if oh. you have no heat, like no heat headers, all this stuff has to be blocked off so you still get plenty of cooling air to your engine. Oh, Path of least cool. resistance air will just come gushing out here. So take these guys off. That's the driver's side heater duct. The broken. Yeah, that side is going to need replacing. This. like from the back side. Oh wow. The fan shroud's coming off too. Or the uh, the fan slash alternator assembly comes off at the same time as well. Yep, now it's grounded right to the crankcase. So very, very, very short strap. fan even has ducts to help guide air one direction, so feed cool. air to that cylinder. You can see from the inside, I mean, they're, they're deflecting air as necessary. So it's kicking down to this cylinder, we got another kick out to help guide air to the back. This one helps you know, keep air at cylinder number six. This is your oil cooler duct. So yeah, there's definitely some thought into 
how this whole system is engineered and it works. Check this out. All of a sudden we've got ourselves an almost bare motor. And no friends inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these are the notorious okay. exhaust bolts or studs? Well, exhaust nuts on nuts. studs. On, on studs, they don't. okay. Uh -oh. Uh oh, see there it is. That always break. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. It's okay, it's not gonna break. Just a little uh, stubborn. Thank goodness, so that's the third one on this side. And how many to go? There's six or is there's there just three? Total of 12. There's 12, oh God. <laughs> three barrel nuts, or excuse me, six barrel nuts and six regular. So are these the ones that always break though? No. Yes. Yeah, I thought I knew that one was gonna go. Oops. No. Nope. It's on video. It can be on video. That's the, the sound of nothing good happening. As soon as it cracked once and then it didn't make any noise after, I was like, uh oh, this is gonna break. Don't break, baby. Don't break. Yeah. Take it. Mike, what are our odds here? It's gonna work or it's not. 50-50, alright, I'll take that. And nope. Not gonna go. She's gonna snap. Yep. Goners. Oh well. We tried hard. Oh yeah, that's a good technique. Success. Yes. All right. Three out of twelve. It's not a not a horrible percentage. I think we'll take it. Oh yeah, look at that. And the headers, turbo, and associated piping are all off now. And the engine continues to get more bare. And my happiness goes up. I hope. Because we haven't found anything too critical yet. These are next to go, and they are air injection nozzles that have been plugged, of course, which is why you see the orange-colored silicone on top of them. They're an emissions thing, so they're not needed. That's why Mike's making quick work of them. We were worried they were gonna give us some trouble, but looks like they're coming straight out, right? Yes, so far. We're removing the front timing chain covers here. That's next on our to-do list. And as per usual, everything's being a bit on the stubborn side. Oh yeah. Look at that. The heart of the engine right there. Well, not the heart, but... <laughs> The timing side, at least. Here comes another timing cover. More prying is needed, as per usual. And there she goes. And if you're wondering, all those washers aren't gonna be reused, so that's why they've fallen to the floor and we don't care about them. That right there is a tensioner that Mike's gonna be removing here in a second. And this obviously holds the tension on the chain.
So next up here, we're gonna be removing the valve cover to reveal our rockers and cam. If you haven't seen a head design look that looks like this. Ooh, whoa, whoa, second one. Totally forgot about this side. And the lower cover comes off. Look at this setup here. Well, tempting to take valve lash off. Valve lash, all right. Oh. <laughs> it seems like the adjusting nut and the adjusting screw are stuck together. And why do we have to loosen the tension off that? Take the tension off any valves. Ah, uh, okay. So everything just closes up? Yep. Makes sense. We have that special tool. Let's crack the old main cam gear bolts. Now we can pop the actual gear off. There we go. Cam gear is off. Fight the chain a little bit. <laughs> now we remove the front timing chain cover. Chain box cover box cover. Further exposing more of the engine. The next attack point here is head studs. head studs. Our head studs, I should say. Excuse my poor grammar. Dave's not here to correct me. So I've got to do it myself. Oh, wow, look at that. They're actually coming loose pretty quickly. I wasn't expecting that. Is there a, a pattern that you need to do, or um, it doesn't really matter? You should go outside the inn. I'm following the factory, or reversing the factory procedure. It's the moment of truth. Oh yeah, look at that. So this is what a Porsche cylinder. cylinder head looks like. Call me impressed. This right here is our oil cooler. And it's on the list of must removes before we can crack off the cylinder head on the second side. We like butter. There we go. Cylinder heads are off, and so far our pistons have looked good, cylinder walls have looked good. We're not going to be reusing this stuff, but it's never a bad thing to see. These are actually the cooling fins. Tins. 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 Cooling tins. They keep the... Uh, Cylinder walls, nice and cool. I'm stating the obvious, of course, because that's what I like to do. And now, the combustion walls, what, what do you call that? Uh, this is the cylinder. cylinder. Cylinder walls just come off. Look at that. Damn, that is cool. Look, there's a piston for you. <laughs> Talk about the opposite of a normal motor. This is just way too cool to see. Wham, bam, thank you, man. And our cylinders Ooh. are off. 
multi-piece rings. Oh, and we've got <laughs> cracked rings here. Oh, we can't focus. Come on, focus for us here. There you go. So after some closer inspection, we've got yet another broken piston ring. But like I said, not a big deal for us because we're replacing all these with some secret pistons, which I'll show you later on. And now comes the piston removal process, which includes popping some clips out before you can punch the wrist pin. The wrist pin out there, yep. And look at that. And that's it. Number six of six. Look at that. Our block is almost bare. Short block. Short block, there we go. So these are our case studs, correct? Case through bolts. Through bolts, that's right, through bolts. As you can see, they go all the way through. Hence the name. Now the wiggle technique, which seems to work excellent. Oh yeah. So that is one side of the case. And behold, the old crankshaft. It's in one piece, I assume, Chris? Oh, yes. <laughs> so part of what makes these things so ridiculously strong, besides how wide this webbing is, is it's only got six rod journals and every single one is supported on both sides. So it's a seven main journal crankshaft. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And at the front, where you have the load of the pulley and everything, is carried by this enormously thick bearing. It's like a full inch and a half wide. So oh, indeed. And that's the internal dry sump pump. So you have a very large suction side, sucks up all the oil that drains down inside the crankcase returns it back, and then here's the high pressure suction, so oil comes through the through the crankcase and then right into there. Boom, high pressure, dispersed throughout the motor. And here we have the oil pump and timing shaft coming out. And one fellow long solid suit. It is out. Come on, crankshaft. There it is. Yes. Well. Mike, what do you say? That was <laughs> a couple hours work, right? All of day's work. We've got ourselves Stripped engine block. So after inspecting the bearings, everything checks out and looks good for the most part. It's actually the perfect time to be replacing them. There's a couple of hot spots here and there, but this engine was healthy overall. And now out comes the camshaft. For inspection. And a little bit of pitting on that lobe. Well, this one's better than the other one. But by the sounds of it, we're still going to need new cams. Oh well, always an excuse to upgrade, right? Yes. <laughs> that is the answer in my books. Upgrade everything. So that's a wrap for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it because I've really enjoyed watching Chris and Mike tear down my motor. It was pretty crazy to see that thing come apart. So 
There's lots more in store as we continue the rebuild of my Porsche 930 Turbo.